Hello and welcome to HT's weekly talk show, The Interview, and our special program, India at 75. Margaret Alva has seen more summers than independent India. Politically, it has been an interesting and eventful journey, be it in the Congress or her running for the Vice President's office earlier this month. As every Indian celebrates the spirit of freedom, we speak to Margaret Alva on India before and after independence in our special segment, Reaching Out with HT in our weekly talk show, The Interview. Welcome to the show, Mrs. Margaret Alva, and thank you for being here with us. Great pleasure. Let me begin with 75 years of India's independence. How does it feel? Well, Coco, I was just five when independence came in 47. So we don't, I mean, I don't really uh, have memories of the actual event. But over the years, these 75 years, we have lived, if I may say so, and breathed the air of freedom. We have been citizens in a country which is independent and I have grown up in an atmosphere where I certainly felt that I was a free citizen in a free country. What stories did you grow up on? I remember so vividly the national flag, the history of the national flag. And uh, we had to draw it in our books, and uh, it was part of the curriculum. So, also stories of freedom, of what it meant, was all gradually, um, if I may say so, introduced in our daily lives. And when the Constitution came in '50, I was just eight. So, not that I understood what it was all about, but over the years, India's constitution, the longest in the world, has made us proud. We have been able to talk about our fundamental rights, about a democratic system in which we vote our representatives, where governments are made or unmade at the will and with the vote of the people. This to me is the greatest achievement of our country. Tell me, from drawing the national flag on a piece of paper to actually holding the tricolor at some point, how did it feel? Well, not just holding it, I have on many occasions unfurled the national flag and saluted it with the national anthem. It is uh, a sense, if I may say, so the flag represents the people of this country, represents our ethos, and it is not just a piece of paper or a piece of cloth. It represents our nation and our unity. Is it a goosebumps moment? Yes, it is. You know, I feel so proud. Um, we are at international events in big stadia where our athletes win and the flag goes up and the national anthem is played. Or we are at various other conferences where we see our flag go up. You know, Independence Day, Republic Day, on the red coat, or, uh, you know, at ceremonial functions on Rajput, we feel so proud to see that flag go up and flutter. And I think it is a symbol of our unity and of our nationhood. And particularly when we, when we saw, uh, those days we had no TVs, so we couldn't watch anything. But when we later saw pictures shown of 
the Union Jack coming down and the Indian flag going up, to me that's a moment of pride and uh, if I may say so, a moment which makes me feel a true Indian. Earlier this month, you contested the vice president's election. Had the results been different, what would your message to Indians be as vice president of the country? Well, my first message would have been that India has place for two women at the top. Because uh, we always have two or three men at the top. We would have had two women. Secondly, my message would have been that whether you belong to the north or the south, to the majority or the minority, whether we are men or women, that every one of us has a place in our country to reach the top and to be part of the decision-making process at the highest level. I would have been proud to be there, but I was also proud to have been asked to represent 22 opposition parties as their nominee, though it was not a battle which we expected to win because the numbers were stacked against us. The question is that you fight a battle. You may win, you may lose, but you have to have the courage to stand up and say this is what we in the opposition stand for. This is what we wish the members of parliament to keep in mind when they elect the vice president. They were expected to vote according to their conscience not according to party dictates, but it doesn't happen. There were so many of them who told me they would like to vote for me, but unfortunately their hands are tied. So on that count, even if you lost the election, do you feel you won the battle? Yes, I feel uh, proud that I had an opportunity to come before my colleagues, my Former, I'm not in parliament now, but I was for 30 years in parliament, being in Central Hall, interacting with them and saying in the media, on the platform, common platform of the opposition, what we stood for, what our concerns were and what the challenges before the country today are. Let me take you down memory lane and you have a very sharp memory. Some interesting anecdotes vis-a-vis -vis Mrs. Indira Gandhi or Rajiv Gandhi on Independence Day. You know, they were routine occasions, Koko. The hoisting of the flag on the Red Fort. We went there diligently in the morning. Very often the rain came and, um, you know, we had to get out of there as fast as possible. There were these speeches by the Prime Ministers year after year, whether it was Raji Desai or it was uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri. I mean, we heard our leaders speak from the Red Fort, saw the flag go up. I mean, it didn't matter whether it was Indira Gandhi or Raji or uh, anybody else. When I was in parliament for 30 years, I did go and I did feel the pride of being with the leadership of my country up on the ramparts of the Red Fort and watching the flag go up. I know there were years of the emergency. There were years when we had wars, we had various other challenges, but that event at the Red Fort has always remained to me a sacrosanct moment. Talking about challenges, 
would you say for the minorities and particularly the Christians, given that you are one, nothing has changed in independent India? No, a lot has changed in 75 years. I have to admit, we grew up in an India, in an atmosphere where we all felt safe, we all felt one, and we all felt Indian. That is no longer so unfortunate. You are told what you can wear and what you cannot wear. You are told whom you can marry and you cannot marry. You are told that you are different because you belong to so-and-so religion or you belong to so-and-so state or because you belong to so-and-so party. Kukum, I know what it means to be discriminated against because of religion, caste or language. Can you tell me that because I am a minority, I have to I have to be apologetic about it, that I have to fall in line with the norms which the majority community sets for me. That's not the constitution. That's not what our freedom fighters fought and died for. I mean, it's, it's sad. And to me, at the end of my life, to see things fall apart, really makes me miss a heart. So would you then say, this is how your India and my India has shaped up? And in that sense, are you dismayed? I am sad. I am disappointed. But I am one who believes that this country will overcome this phase, just as it overcame the emergency and many other challenges of wars, of droughts, of famines. I believe this is a phase. This cannot last. The people of India have their feet firmly in the soil of a democratic India. And I believe that the pendulum which has swung to one side will swing back to the middle. There will be again an inclusive, peaceful nation. It seems a long haul because the BJP government, it seems, is here to stay for many more years. That's what you think. That's what the press seems to be projecting all the time. But the true Democrats, the voters and the people of India know what is good for the country. Their soul and their strength, I believe, will ultimately dominate and will restore to my motherland what is our heritage? If given a chance, what would you like to change, rework or redraw? Well, the first thing I would say, honestly, is to restore our institutions to respect the norms of a secular India. Second, I would want economic policies and developmental goals to be recast so that disparities that are growing in our society, in our country, in our economy can be bridged. You have spoken about India's failures. How would you sum up India's success story? Oh, we have made fantastic progress from an impoverished colony in 1947, where we did not have 
the capacity to produce the smallest thing of daily needs. We have reached space exploration. Education has spread everywhere. Women have come out, have led this country, led the states, led political parties. We have had a woman go into space. And in the world, in the Committee of Nations, India stands tall and proud. 75 years is a chapter in the history of the country. There's much more India will achieve. But please, please let us not forget what the freedom fighters did for us. Let us not say that there was no India before 2014. Let us not try to rewrite history and recast our, if I may say so, achievements to suit one way of thinking. We are proud of our achievements. We are proud of our leaders. And even our present Prime Minister, Modi ji, is doing a lot around the world, in India, for development. He has also he is also making his contribution. But doesn't mean to say that Jawaharlal Nehru did not exist or that an Indira Gandhi can be buried or, or uh, totally uh, wiped out from our history or that a Moraji Desai or, um, uh, or um, Lal Bahadur Shastri did not make any contribution to India or that Atal Bihari Vajpayee didn't matter. These were all stalwarts. They have all contributed. They have all helped to make India what it is. Some have large chests, they say. Others may have had small ones. From the country to the Congress, let me ask you, what is it that you would like to change about the Congress party where you have spent a lifetime? The Congress party was the party of the freedom movement, right? It took its origin from there under Mahatma Gandhi. It has contributed, it has worked, it has failed, and sometimes maybe it has been punished by the people when it went wrong. Every political party in this country has seen ups and downs. The BJP has grown, grown sorry, from two seats to where they are today. The Congress had an overwhelming majority under Rajiv Gandhi and we came down. There's nothing permanent of defeat or victory in politics. Those who are there go down and those who are down go up. I am not holding a brief for any one political party. I am talking about a democratic system in which if there is a level playing ground of free press and free elections, then the voice of the people will prevail. Talking purely objectively, where, when and how did the Congress decline begin? I'll tell you. The growth of regional parties, the growth of caste-based parties, and the whole um, sort of base which the Congress had through the freedom movement and afterwards has been divided because of, as I said, local parties, because of uh, caste-based parties, because of regional interests. Parties have grown, other interests have asserted themselves. Is it that or is it weak leadership at the top? No, I don't think so. We have had very strong state leaders, Rajsekhar Reddy in Andhra, who got 41 out of 42 seats. We have had very powerful leaders in the states. What about the Congress high command, as you would say, or as congressmen 
describe the top leadership of the Congress party. What do you mean by a high command? I don't believe in a high command. I believe that the Congress selects its leadership in the states and at the center. I say that leadership at the top has to be a united leadership. It has to work for the good of the country and the people. And the Congress does have the challenge of, um, if I may say so, of uh, putting together and respecting the interests of states while uh, while fighting its own battles. The Congress has to find a way of compromise and of finding common ground. And that is not easy. Your last word on 75 years of freedom before I let you go. Well, I can say there were many around the world who said India would fall apart within a decade or two. They didn't expect India to hold, especially after partition. There, were, there was so much being said around the world about India staying free, India staying united, and India being able to sort out its problems of poverty and development. We have overcome all the challenges. We are today a vibrant, a strong and a proud nation. I feel that the future is going to be a golden era for India. Mrs. Margaret Alva, on this optimistic note, let me thank you. Let me thank you for your time and for being here with us. Great pleasure, Kunku. Thank you.